Good morning. I'm Kyle Beasley, Chairman of this of the Board of Directors for the Chamber of Commerce and a Senior Vice President at Bank of Albuquerque. I want to welcome you all to the Chamber's Public Safety Signature Event, our third annual uh, Crime Stat Briefing. And if you're concerned about crime in Albuquerque, as we are, then you've come to the right place. We're going to hear today about the latest crime statistics and trends in Albuquerque, crime fighting initiatives and strategies of our uh, DA's office, and DA Raul Torres' perspective on important criminal justice issues and challenges facing our state and Bernalillo County. We're very happy to have DA Torres with us today. He's, he's been a true partner of the business community, and he's making incredible progress uh, toward tougher, more strategic criminal prosecution. For anyone who has followed the Chamber's work, you know that our, our organization is focused on addressing three major challenges to long-term economic growth in New Mexico. We call them bold issue groups, and they are crime and public safety, education reform, and downtown transformation. If we can substantially improve the academic performance of our kids, create safer communities for people to live and work, and build a vibrant downtown for residents and visitors alike, we, we believe our city and state will thrive. Our businesses will grow, jobs will be added, and wages will rise. Each year, we hold events to bring the business community the very latest information and perspectives from high-level decision makers and experts in these three big areas. We're happy that you've joined us uh, for our public safety big event today. Let me take just a minute to recognize uh, the sponsors for today's event. PM Resources and CEO Pat Vincent Colon, New Mexico Mutual and its CEO Norm Becker, Bank of Albuquerque, represented by myself and our market CEO Jennifer Thomas, U.S. Bank and its regional president Paul DePaula, University of New Mexico, President Garnet Stokes, including UNM Health Sciences Center, UNM Health, UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center, and UNM Athletics, Comcast. Vice President Chris Duncanson, Albertson's Market, Vice President Travis Cheney, Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Mexico, and its CEO, Kurt Shipley, Geltmore LLC, and its CEO, Paul Silverman, Janes Corp, and its Chairman and CEO, Rick Marquardt, Molina Healthcare, and Executive VP, uh, Carolyn Ingram, Presbyterian Healthcare Services, CEO, Dale Maxwell, Western Sky Community Care and CEO Tony Hernandez, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Executive Director Scott Heinemann, Munirac, CEO Peter Lorenz, General Mills, Albuquerque Plant Manager Isabel Capones, KPMG Managing Partner Fred Winter, New Mexico Bank and Trust President and CEO Greg Leyendecker, KOB General Manager Michelle Donaldson, and U.S. Eagle Federal Credit Union CEO, Marsha Majors. Thank you to all, all these companies and organizations for your generosity and engagement. And a big thank you also to Alliance Video, Audio Visual uh, as well for their help with the presentation today. Before we hear from DA Torres, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chamber President and CEO, Terry Cole, in our public safety big chairman, Paul DePaula of US Bank, to talk briefly about the chamber's beliefs, work, and priorities in the public safety arena. Hi, Terry, how are you today? I'm doing great. Um, how are you doing, Kyle? Doing good, thank you. Good. good. Uh, shall I take it away? Take it away. All right, thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, as Kyle mentioned, uh, we're a community-minded organization. Our interests are not narrow. We want to make big progress on issues that will lift our economy across the board and for the long term. And that includes reducing crime. There is no question that public safety affects economic growth. And over the last 10 years, our businesses and families have expressed unprecedented, persistent, and across the board, high crime. We continue to be among the nation's leaders in certain crime categories. We're pleased to have seen some modest improvements over the last few years, but we have a long way to go to bring crime rates down to a reasonable level. 
I'm pleased to have Paul DePaula, Regional President of U.S. Bank with me. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Terry. Thank you. You know, the phrase these days is hanging in there, right? Absolutely. Indeed. Well, it's good to be with you. Paul chairs the committee of the Chamber Board of Directors and oversees our public safety work. The goal we've set for the chamber is to advocate for and help implement local and state level policies and practices that will result in a reduction in crime in Bernalillo County and a tough, strategic, fair, and sophisticated criminal justice system. It's an ambitious goal and we're in for the long haul. Paul, why don't you walk us through the chamber's core beliefs about crime and public safety in New Mexico? Will do, Terry, and good morning and thanks and hello to everybody. And just wanted to point out out of my true respect for our guest speaker today and for chamber staff and all of our chamber members, I thought I'd wear the suit and tie so that I don't forget how to tie this tie, you know, and don't seem to be able to wear this as often. But uh, as Terry mentioned, we are on a crime reduction mission, and you can see our core beliefs and guiding principles on the screen in front of you. But we believe that high crime rates, rise business costs, impact hiring, expansion, and relocation decisions. And in our opinion, we need a criminal justice system that is highly efficient and takes crime seriously. Those who commit crimes in Albuquerque must face swift and certain apprehension and punishment. It is the deterrent. It is the key. If a person believes that they will get caught and punished quickly for committing an illegal act, that will deter crime. On the other hand, if our justice system allows people to offend and not face immediate consequences for their actions, then they're more likely to commit additional crimes. And for many years, that has been our problem. The same offenders repeatedly committing crimes. We know, of course, that we can't incarcerate our way out of this crime problem. But as a justice system, we can do better at identifying the relatively small number of serious criminals who are driving the lion's share of the crime in our community. So let's focus our resources intently on them. Most of them are part of small crime networks and data can help find them. And improved technology can help police catch and track the offenders and help prosecutors build stronger cases. We believe that an efficient justice system is bad for criminals and good for public safety. And finally, we recognize that addictions and behavioral health challenges are contributors to public safety issues and that is why we also support things like improved overnight sheltering for homeless, the construction of a, of a crisis triage center to handle emergency medical health situations, and diversion programs that work especially for our young and first time offenders. Terry, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Paul, for all your good work. You know, uh, it takes leaders like you to really make a difference. So. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. And so does our membership. You know, we've done a lot of work in the public safety space, advocating for efficiency improvements, new technology, the increased use of data, additional funding, and criminal justice policy changes. So here are just a few highlights. We now have increased penalties for those who use a gun in the commission of a crime or illegally possess a firearm. We worked with the city and APD to get over 12 million in state funding for crime fighting technology, including gunshot detectors and license plate readers, and to identify stolen vehicles and track serious criminals. And our state's first crime strategies unit at the Bernalillo County DA's office recently moved from a pilot program to a permanent high tech crime fighting group. And as you may recall, the chamber led a delegation of local officials several, year, several years ago on a trip to San Francisco to study its crime strategies unit. As a CSU brings crime analysts, investigators, and prosecutors together, 
and uses data analytics and impressive technologies to identify and bring down serious and well-connected criminals and their networks. The CSU is doing tremendous work. It's up the game on criminal prosecution, and I'm sure DA Taurus will have more to say on the CSU soon. Finally, the chamber competed for and was awarded a $1.2 million grant from the Department of Justice to build two new crime fighting tools that will reside at the DA's office and help prosecutors and police more efficiently fight crime. The first tool which we're developing in collaboration with New Mexico Tech and RS21 is called Case Catcher. When it's completed, police agencies will package and refer their cases to the DA's office electronically for the first time ever. Discovery for cases, photos, documents, videos, etc., will all be managed within the tool. Prosecutors and police will communicate about discovery issues and within the tool. This kind of system has never existed in New Mexico. And in fact, most justice systems nationally aren't able to do this. This tool will help criminal cases launch more quickly. It will help identify cases that aren't ready to be launched. It will cut down on case dismissals, which are so often dismissed because of discovery issues. It will allow the DA's office to share discovery materials and defense attorneys electronically and track it. And our current process, which is ad hoc, rife with errors, often still paper-based and slow, will soon be a thing of the past. And Terry, as I understand it, isn't our chamber the first to receive a grant like this from DOJ? Absolutely. And, you know, we just couldn't be prouder of it. We're so excited about it. And I think uh, D.A. Torres will uh, speak to it a bit when he's up here in a minute. But that's fantastic. And it shows how involved we are in helping our local enforcement agencies fight crime. And in the coming year, we have several priorities that we'll be working on. And I would like to cover maybe four of them for you today. Number one, support efforts to increase the number of police officers on our streets, oppose policies that make it harder to recruit officers to Albuquerque, and resist any effort to defund our local police agencies. Number two, encourage local police collaboration with federal law enforcement agencies. We need the feds help, especially when it comes to arresting serious violent offenders, prosecuting them in the federal system where tougher sentences are far more likely. Number three, we'll launch the case catcher tool that Terry described in the coming year. And the fourth, and I believe this is a, a big deal that also is impacting our community, and that's we're continuing our work to reform pretrial detention rules that still are allowing too many serious defendants to be released from jail prior to trial. Okay, Terry, that's it for, for us. Anything? to add before I introduce the DA? Thanks, Paul. Nothing more from me, though I do want to personally thank and recognize DA Torres for his responsiveness to the business community and his partnership with us on so many issues. He's also fun to work with. He doesn't take himself too seriously, but he works very, very hard every single day. You really just can't get better than that, DA Torres. So we have a great DA who is bringing criminal prosecution in the 21st century, and we're happy to be helping and supporting him. Well, I agree. I agree totally, Terry. And, and District Attorney Torres' bio, as I have in front of me, is lengthy. So I'll hit just a few of the high points. But he's been our DA for four years. After serving as a federal prosecutor, a senior advisor in President Obama's Department of Justice, D.A. Torres was reelected to his second term, which will begin in just a few weeks. He's worked at every level of the justice system as assistant U.S. attorney, assistant attorney general, and assistant district attorney. But he's also a graduate, a Harvard graduate, received a master's degree from the London School of Economics and earned a law degree from Stanford. He and his wife 
Nasha, and they have two children. After, which is, uh, he's, he's a terrific family man as I've uh, come to know him. So something that we need to point out to everybody is after DA Torres speaks, we will take some questions from our attendees. During the DA's presentation, if you'd like to pose a question, please type it in the Q&A box on your screen. Please note, do not use the chat. Type it in the Q&A box on your screen and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So DA Torres, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours for our Crime Stat Briefing 2020. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And I also wanna thank Terry uh, and the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce for being such incredible partners over the years. Um, I, I will say I really appreciate um, you know, calling me a, a good family man. I'll give you a, a, a quick anecdote on my way out the door this morning. My children were a little surprised to see me in a suit again and asked me if I was going to give another speech uh, to my laptop, which they think is hilarious. Um, but um, more importantly, uh, I, I got to, to walk out the door just as the Zoom link for our two children failed. Um, and my wife gave me one of those looks. So I will be sure to let her know um, that the, at least the business community thinks I'm a, a solid uh, family guy. I don't know if she shares that opinion right about now, but um, I certainly do appreciate uh, being invited back and given an opportunity to, to talk once again, not only about the challenges inside the district attorney's office, but more importantly, um, the broader challenges in our community and in the criminal ju justice system across the board. Uh, I, I would like to say that, uh, you know, if you've never seen this presentation before, you're you're sort of in for some surprises, uh, but but to not to give too much away, what you're going to see today is very much uh, what the chamber and its members have seen in the last few years, which is an overview of the crime statistics in our community, the systemic um, performance um, measurements and perspective that we have on some of those issues, um, our heavy reliance on on technology and the development of new technology, including. Uh, the partnership we have with the chamber in developing this new case catcher system, which I think is is going to be uh, a real milestone in criminal justice around the country. Uh, and then also some of the broader legislative and policy initiatives that I think uh, go beyond just the immediate needs um, of our crime crisis here in the community, but also point the, the sort of the, the way towards uh, a deeper understanding of the underlying dynamics of crime and some of the systemic reforms that we need to engage in. And so let me let me start, I think, in the most, if I can, uh, in the most important place to start, and that has to do with the composition of crime. Um, this is a good place for everyone to start because we need to understand um, that by and large, everything that you see in blue and green there is property crime. And the good news, um, which, which Terry alluded to in the introduction, is that th in this space, um, we've seen some pretty substantial reductions in, in crime over the last three years. Uh, unfortunately, um, what we haven't seen is a corresponding reduction in violent crime. Um, homicides are on pace with, with last year, which was a record year. Violent crime is, is up about 4% uh, based on what we've seen thus far. Um, and so despite the fact that we're making um, some, some substantial improvements in property crime, I think everyone agrees that the extraordinarily high rate of, of violent crime, specifically gun violence and homicides, is what we really need to focus on. And that, that is where um, we sort of take our strategic orientation as an organization in thinking about what kind of new technologies and strategies we can deploy uh, to really hit that um, uh, as hard as we can. To give everyone an overview, uh, this is just a, a very basic graph of what are commonly referred to as the UCR uh, Part 1 incidents. That's the, the compilation of crime that every community in the country reports to the FBI. Um, I'm pleased to, to say, again, that the, the sort of the high watermark peak crime in this community occurred in August of 2017, and you can see a pretty steady decline um, over the last three years, unfortunately, and we'll get into the details, that has mostly been driven by the, the reduction in, in property crime. 
Um, so this is another way of visualizing or understanding um, the crime trends in the community. I've shown this to the chamber and its members uh, almost every year, I think, that we've done this presentation. And, and again, to remind attendees, we do this um, in a way that reflects the movement of crime that is set against um, patterns, uh, frankly, that are driven by the weather. What we try to do is remove those inconsistencies. Every single year, the high water mark for crime is usually July and August, because those are the hottest months of the year. Um, January and February being the coldest months of the year, those are the low crime months. And so what this graph shows you is a standard view of crime across um, over time when you remove the inconsistencies that are sort of uh, made apparent in the data um, with the weather. And so you see that solid green band with the exception of a couple of months that's driven the overall um, perspective. And, and again, this is um, largely the result of what you're seeing here, which is property crime. Um, it is a pretty um, impressive run. Um, for example, this is larceny. This is one of the key metrics that every community reports um, to the FBI. It is down substantially. Um, also very important for the community is the reduction in motor vehicle theft. Everyone I know in attendance here sees um, the impact um, not only on everyone's day-to-day -day life, but frankly, on the economic uh, prospects of our community by sitting very, very high um, on the list of communities for motor vehicle theft. Um, fortunately, we've, we've started to move down on the list of top communities in part because of some strategic investments that we've done and partnerships that we've done, not only with the Albuquerque Police Department, but also with other state and local agencies. So we've been able to move the needle on motor vehicle theft. And I would imagine that, that this progress is going to continue. This is something that's new data that I thought would be uh, relevant for the business community in, in the time of COVID in, in terms of what, how is COVID reshaping um, or impacting um, our, our crime composition. And this is commercial burglary. What you've seen over the last you know, eight or nine months is a pretty steady reduction uh, in residential burglary in larceny and other things. Unfortunately, you've seen a corresponding increase in commercial burglary. And frankly, we think this is a, a function of um, less, less traffic and less attendance um, and just fewer people in those commercial establishments. So this is something that I think is, is very much connected uh, to the pandemic and very much connected to um, you know, the restrictions that we've got and the, and the less uh, traffic that we're seeing in commercial establishments. This, um, as I mentioned before, is where most of our work really needs to focus, and that is on violent crime and specifically um, the, the use of guns um, and um, threats of violence to, to intimidate and harm and, and, and take the lives of other members of our community. Um, again, I included commercial robbery in this. We haven't shown this type of specific data to the chamber and its members in the past. Um, we have seen a, um, an uptick, and you will you will notice um, at the end we'll we'll have a, a a slide that compares property crime and violent crime. Uh, but you'll notice that our violent crime problem was improving until about the the middle of uh, 2019, about July or August of 2019, and then you really started to see an uptick. Um, and then the most troubling place and and the most troubling category which is where we're gonna focus our efforts, is aggravated assault. Aggravated assault is, is anytime you use a weapon um, on the streets and, and threaten to shoot someone, harm someone, or actually in, in this category, aggravated assault that's reported to the FBI actually also includes aggravated battery. So anytime you shoot um, another individual and they survive, um, there's a, it's a, you know, a, an injury that's caused by a firearm, what you can see is there has been no sustained improvement over um, in this category, uh, frankly, for the last seven years. The reason this is so important is this is, as you might imagine, the same place where you're going to try and move the needle on reducing your homicides. Um, because as your aggravated assaults and aggravated batteries remain stubbornly high, 
obviously a subcategory of that or those instances where um, the use of a weapon in the commission of a crime results in, in someone's death. And so this is a place where we need to make substantial improvements um, if we're gonna change the narrative and change the future for this community. Um, so when you take these two side by side, and I know there's some um, folks in attendance that are, that are very interested in the data, one thing I will point out is look at the different scale, uh, scales that are used both for property crime and violent crime. You know, the, the property crime is measured in the, in the units of several thousand. Violent crime is, is, as you can see, several hundred. So these are certainly not on the same scale, but we, what we try to do is boil them down and then look at the pattern side by side so that you can really see, um, frankly, a tale of two cities. As you can see on, uh, on the left, you've got um, property crime with a pretty steady decline, um, some improvements in violent crime that started at the end of 2017 and continued till about the su last summer. And then it flattened out and started to rise again through the end of 2019 and the beginning of in the first quarter of 2020. Um, we have some data uh, that show, uh, unfortunately, like I said, uh, I think APD just recently reported yesterday uh, that they're investigating the 70th homicide. I think last year there were 84. We still have several weeks to go in the year. So um, our homicide numbers are going to be um, very high this year, certainly much higher than a lot of other communities, both nationally and in our region. And this is the, this is the focus that we need to have, a relentless focus um, on our tactics and strategies, the partnerships that we have with local law enforcement, and, and as Paul mentioned, federal law enforcement. Um, increasingly, because of the problems that we face in, in the state system, quite frankly, and getting violent offenders detained, we take a lot of the information that we have and increasingly shift that and share that over with the ATF, the FBI, DEA, and other federal law enforcement partners, uh, simply because we, can, we know that if we can get them into federal court, where I have a number of my prosecutors cross-designated, we, uh, we are likely to have those individuals detained. There is a subset, uh, and we, I don't think we've included the graphic in, in this presentation, there is a subset of, of individuals who um, are subject to both state and federal detention. Uh, the rate of detention in the federal system is, is something like 90%. Uh, the, state of, the rate of detention in the state system is less than 50%. And these are your exact same um, individuals with the exact same criminal history. Um, and they're just, one is walking into a courthouse, federal courthouse, on the north side of Lomas, and one is walking into a state court um, on the south side of Lomas, and that's the only difference between these individuals. Um, but the the systemic differences between the state and federal system are profound. Um, one thing that I know, and I've received a lot of uh, inquiries about, both from the public and other members of the business community, is COVID's impact on the criminal justice system. And one of the ways we um, thought to to demonstrate this to you is to give you a sense of the reduction in the number of felony cases um, that have occurred throughout 2020. We have seen relatively uh, flat numbers and, and there has there's not been a significant decline in the number of felony cases that have been referred to the office. But as you can see, the number of, of felony cases that have been initiated, those are cases that um, have been formally um, started by my office, um, we are down about 35%. We're operating at a, about 65% capacity. Um, in other words, we are about 1,300 felonies below what we would expect based on our, our recent historical average. Another way of thinking about this, and it, and it actually provides a, a useful way for examining a, a certain policy proposal advanced by the judiciary, which I have strongly opposed, um, and, and I've strongly opposed a number of the, the sort of policy initiatives. Um, uh, so this, this probably falls into that same category. Um, members of the chamber will remember from last year um, and the year before a sustained attempt by the, the district court to reduce this office's access to the grand jury. Um, it is something like the case management order that, uh, that has only frankly been applied in, the, in Bernalillo County 
Um, and my position on this has been very clear that uh, for a community that has seen sustained um, and frankly, historically abnormal uh, levels of violent crime, reducing our access to the grand jury uh, imposes a massive resource burden on police officers and on our prosecutors. And in order to understand that, uh, what the way to think about it is there's two ways to initiate a felony case in New Mexico. One is to go to a full preliminary hearing. One is to go through a grand jury. They end up with exactly the same outcome if there's a finding of probable cause. The difference is a grand jury usually takes 15 or 20 minutes and usually requires the participation of one or two witnesses. They almost never uh, fail to occur and they certainly don't fail to occur because the defendant himself or herself has decided not to show up to court. Uh, under our current rules, preliminary hearings in New Mexico are full evidentiary hearings, which means they are very lengthy, they're very resource intensive. And if any one of the participants, including the defendant himself, doesn't appear, uh, we can't launch the case. And so one of the sort of the un, unrecognized and unplanned benefits of this, of this uh, impact of COVID on our system is to get a real time view of what our system looks like if you completely eliminate the grand jury, um, as we did in March in this jurisdiction. And I agree with that decision for public health reasons. I think it makes sense uh, to not convene the grand jury uh, because there were concerns about safety and the participants in the grand jury uh, themselves uh, made it very plain to the leaders in the criminal justice system that they didn't feel entirely safe in that process. Um, but, and this is the important point for the chamber and for members of the community, when we are on the other side of the pandemic, when we have a vaccine that is widely available, and when the criminal justice system starts to function um, as it should, one of the things that you will see from my office is a request to the district court and the New Mexico Supreme Court to substantially increase, not just return our normal access to the grand jury, but to actually increase um, the available grand jury panels so that we can start digging out of these, this hole because, um, as you can probably imagine, I still have to deal with these 1,300 felonies. Uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna make an impact on public safety, I have to have an efficient way to initiate felony cases. And I can imagine that in the late spring and summer when things hopefully start turning back to normal, um, we're gonna make a, a sustained effort to get, to get our access to the grand jury back so that we can make up this difference. Um, another thing, another systemic feature that I think we really need to uh, drill into and be aware of is um, the state of our pretrial detention system. Um, we, we received word from the New Mexico Supreme Court that uh, unfortunately the judiciary did not recognize that there was a substantial need for uh, changing or altering the current framework. Um, I will tell you that is not at all surprising to me. The judiciary has not recognized um, or frankly agreed with police or prosecutors that this is a problem. Uh, I, I can tell you that one you know, sort of good piece of information is that for the first time ever, uh, we are now getting, we are, we are, our motions to detain are granted at 46.5% of the time and only denied 46% of the time. So this represents the first time ever that uh, we slightly more of our uh, motions are granted. But to put things in perspective, um, the New Jersey prosecutors that, that we um, are familiar with and work with, they actually file detention rates at four times the rate at which our prosecutors currently do in this county, and their detentions are granted at a higher level. So we are objectively um, out of sync with the rest of the nation when it comes to pretrial detention. You can see that here. And by the way, this is data compiled by the judiciary itself. This, is, this, this data is not, wasn't compiled by my office. This is data that was compiled uh, by the judiciary. And what you're seeing on the left is the uh, failure to appear rate, what we call the FTA rate. That's the rate at which defendants don't show up in court. Um, there's Bernalillo County at the top in red. And then you can see comparable jurisdictions, all of which have done some form of bail reform. And we are 
substantially higher in terms of the number of individuals who fail to show up in court. And as I mentioned before, um, how this interacts with our preliminary hearing system, when they don't show up in court, I can't start a case. The case just stops completely. So this is, a, this is one of those complex sort of in the weeds aspects of the criminal justice system. But if we don't get a handle on this, we, we simply aren't gonna, aren't gonna make sustained improvements. On the right, what you're seeing are or what, what are called safety rates. And the way to think about this is it's a measurement of how often the people um, who are released commit new crimes. Um, the folks in Cook County, Allegheny County, Washington, D.C., Kentucky, and New Jersey, again, jurisdictions that have done uh, bail reform in, a, in a, frankly, a more effective manner, see substantially fewer defendants committing new crimes when they're out. So the bottom line here is we have more people getting out, and um, the people who get out commit more crimes when they do that. So one of the things to think about is how are these decisions being made? On the left um, is a representation of the composition of crime for those defendants that we moved to detain. And as you can see, 66%, two thirds of the, of the people that we moved to detain um, are there for a violent crime. Uh, ironically and surprisingly, what you see on the right is that the PSA, the Arnold tool that's used by the courts to make these decisions, actually um, recommends detention of violent criminals only 26% of the time, and they substantially uh, recommend detention for property offenders and drug offenders. Uh, this, is, this is upside down. I mean, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have a tool that was designed specifically to focus on the worst of the worst and the most violent and dangerous, and yet the tool that is being used actually uh, recommends detention for property and drug offenders at a much higher rate. Um, this is counterintuitive, especially from the judiciary, which, is, which consistently talks about the need for uh, interventions for people who are nonviolent, which we agree with, but the very tool that they're using actually doesn't lead to that result. Um, so those are just a few of the structural issues, the preliminary hearing and preliminary or, and detention rules that I think are gonna be, uh, they're gonna have to be addressed. I think given the posture and the response of the New Mexico judiciary, there's, there's frankly only one uh, response left, and that is action at the legislature. I don't foresee uh, any movement, uh, unfortunately, on these issues, given the response of uh, leaders in Santa Fe um, and others um, to this issue. I think there is um, a deference to the judicial response to see if this is going to work. And um, you know, our position is we are stuck with these rules and we're gonna do the best that we can. Um, what does that mean in practical terms? It means putting a greater emphasis on our strategic um, capabilities inside the district attorney's office and specifically building out um, the kind of real time actionable intelligence that is critical to really driving down violent crime. I've mentioned this many times before, Paul alluded to it, and Terry alluded to it in the introduction. And this is the simple recognition for that violent crime problem that we're all very concerned about and the gun violence problem that we're all very concerned about. 60 to 70% of that is driven by half a percent of, a, of, of this community and frankly, any community's population. So it is a tiny, tiny number of networked individuals, uh, groups or gangs who are engaged in drug trafficking, firearms trafficking, and resolving their disputes on the streets uh, with guns that drive the overwhelming share of violent crime. Um, there are, in any, in any community, there are a number of homicides that are related to domestic violence um, or um, other incidents that are, I would say, random in nature. Those, are, they, those do not lend themselves to predictive analytical approaches or, or strategic reorientation in a number of ways, but this, um, the impact of groups and gangs on violent crime is clear. It's been addressed. And for those communities around the country who have made real reductions in their violent crimes, they always start um, and usually very clearly see significant gains whenever they focus on those networked individuals. That is why the development of the new case catcher system, which um, 
uh, Terry and Paul both alluded to is so incredibly important because not only does it help us uh, to standardize information that comes into the office, um, it also enhances dramatically our strategic capabilities by putting the information that we are receiving from law enforcement into a, in a uniform digital format, which I can then uh, disaggregate and analyze along with other data streams to get a comprehensive picture of the people that we need to be focused on. This is uh, an, an early mock-up, an early wireframe uh, of what this is going to look like. The, the basic way of thinking about it is uh, for those of you uh, like me who have used uh, automated software to file their taxes every year, this is akin to TurboTax for the district attorney's office. Right now, we still receive documents, uh, hard file, uh, videotape recordings, audio recordings in multiple formats and, a, and largely paper-based system. What this will do is will automate and streamline the way in which law enforcement can submit case information to us. That, as Terry noted, will dramatically reduce uh, the omission of certain discoverable materials that oftentimes will lead to a dismissal later in the life of a case. Um, it will also provide a framework for law enforcement to standardize their investigations so that they know if you're submitting um, a DWI case, it always has this basic information and it'll be readily apparent if that information is missing. But more important, as I mentioned, Case Catcher will allow us to synthesize all of this digital information with other um, databases that we currently access. Um, why is that so important? Well, it gives us the actionable intelligence that we need um, to uh, deliver to not only our analysts and our prosecutors, but actually if we process this information in a timely fashion, we can deliver it back to our law enforcement partners and paint a pretty comprehensive picture of where they need to focus their very limited resources. And so what you're seeing on the right is a rendering of what this all looks like um, from Sandia National Labs. Sandia being one of our partners, New Mexico Tech being another partner. Um, we integrate social media, cameras, sensors, you know, billions of, of different types of information, digital information, social media accounts, police reports, MVD records, property records. We synthesize all of that and through some pretty powerful computing and, and uh, artificial intelligence technology, create a pretty clear rendering of what things look like. I've showed this, I know in the past, uh, to uh, members of the chamber. What you're seeing on the left is an actual rendering of real violent crime data from the Albuquerque Police Department. And, and I know it looks like a tangled mess, but what it really is showing you are those clusters or those groups of individuals who are highly impactful and largely responsible for that uh, really, really tough um, violent crime component of our overall public safety um, posture right now that we need to dig into. What you're looking at on the right is what an analyst in our office is looking at now. Um, we actually, I've clearly, taken out all the identities, but this is a real um, network. It's a, what, we, what we call a co-offender network. And you can see the smaller players in that network. And then those big nodes, those um, larger uh, and more important individuals are those people who are hyper-connected to other people in the group. And if you focus your energy and effort there, you can, you can have and, and realize some real sustained reductions in violent crime. Um, so what we're trying ultimately to do is to identify those crime drivers so that we can prevent situations like this. This young man, Demarcus Blea, uh, was a young man who went uh, one evening to pick up his girlfriend, was driving her home, and was killed in a pretty violent car crash um, by a group of individuals who had stolen that car. They'd carjacked someone on the other side of town and were uh, running from police. Uh, and in the course of that pursuit and trying to flee from police, uh, ran through this intersection and, and killed DeMarcus. Um, he is the face and he is, and those like him, of young people in this community whose lives have been cut short 
and he is um, and others like him are the motivation for us to develop this new approach. So what is it that we're trying to do and who are we trying to identify? Uh, one of the folks that uh, was in that car that day um, was this individual, a young man by the name of Quantes Kavinka. And uh, I'll play a little bit of the video on the left. This is social media um, analysis that was done by the Crime Strategies Unit, as Terry mentioned, a now permanent feature of my office. Um, and this is something that we specialize in, is the use of phone and social media analysis to understand who these individuals are after we have a, a deeper um, understanding of the co-offender network. What is interesting about um, what you're seeing here is that uh, Quantes Kavinka was convicted by my office, um, but over the objection of my office was placed in what's called the young adult court. Um, young adult court in other communities is specifically designed to give usually nonviolent offenders an opportunity to engage in reform, treatment, rehabilitation, um, and the types of things that we um, hope that someone his age can, can avail himself of and leave a life of crime. Um, this video here on the left um, is something that was taken by agents in my office, not before Quantis Kavinka uh, was sentenced for his crime, but actually in the weeks he was placed in young adult court. So this is a picture of a young man uh, shooting off a firearm on the west side of Albuquerque. Uh, and he uh, was doing this um, after the judge had given him a second chance. We presented this information to the court. The court uh, remanded Quantes Kovinka uh, to jail for 24 hours and then put him back on the streets, again, over our objections. Um, unfortunately, uh, Quantes Kovinka didn't take advantage of either the second chance or the third chance. And I think a little more than um, two months ago, he was found going about 120 um, on I-25 here in Albuquerque. He was pulled over by state police. And in his possession were uh, uh, distribution amounts of fentanyl and a firearm. Um, this is an example of a system that is broken. Uh, Quantes Kavinka was involved in a carjacking. He killed a young man in the community. He was released back into the community. He was convicted by my office. He should have been sent to prison. He wasn't. He should have been remanded to prison even after he was displaying this firearm and um, unfortunately was again taken into custody. We're actively looking to take Quantes Kavinka and those like him and send it into federal court so that we can remove him from the community and, and enhance public safety. What does all this though have to do uh, with the analytical approach that we talked about? Well, if you remember the uh, co-offender network that I showed you in that large uh, uh, sort of computer rendering of violent groups in the community, that's Quantes Kavinka. Um, this is um, a real life picture of his uh, co-offender network. And I can tell you that without getting into specific details, every member of that co-offender network um, is now aware. We have made those offenders know our law enforcement partners, both at the state and federal level. Appropriate action um, can be taken and investigations can be undertaken to address that co-offender network. In a nutshell, um, by building case catcher, by streaming in data, by analyzing all of this, we hope to understand these networks before someone's life is taken and not after. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to shift and talk to you a bit about um, some of the larger legislative priorities and other things that we are advancing. Um, and the best way to do that is, I think, to... Um, Actually, let me pause because I, I uh, got ahead of myself. I want to show you instead um, the, the latest iteration of our um, analytical and digital um, um, technological development. And this is uh, a mock-up of the new system, not the old red blob system that I've shown you for the past couple of years. This is a mock-up of a system called Intella. 
that we are developing now in partnership with RS21, which is an extraordinary local um, data and analytical company. I know that probably members um, of the chamber are familiar with their story. And what this is, is uh, what the new analytical approach will be. Um, this again is under development, um, but, it, but this is a, frankly a first of its kind piece of technology, certainly among district attorneys, but even most large police departments in the country don't have the capability of rendering all of their police data to show the broad picture, but then also filter down into co-offender networks um, so that we can um, not only understand who we're dealing with inside the criminal justice system once they have a live case, but also redeploy that data as actionable intelligence to frontline police officers. Um, this is the future of law enforcement not only in this community, but in the entire country, it is precision. Precision enforcement, precision policing, precision prosecution. It is a way to enhance public safety and also separate those individuals who are violent drivers of crime from those individuals who may have substance abuse and mental health disorders who are better dealt with in a public health and uh, rehabilitation setting than they are um, through the Department of Corrections. This I know is something, and I've talked about this project for a number of years, and I know um, for members who are, are watching this and have seen my presentations in the past, you may say, well, why, you know, we've been talking about this for several years, why are we not further along? Um, one of the unfortunate things that occurred in the budget fights and the budget struggles that we've had up in Santa Fe over a couple of years is the sustainability and predictability of the funding that goes into the development of the crime strategies unit and our technological platforms. Um, to make a long story short, we received several, you know, about $3 million uh, in funding uh, over a couple of years. And we used two and a half million dollars, or actually we used um, a, a little more than half of the monies that were appropriated to my office with an understanding both from the department, from DFA and from LFC that we would have access to the money. Well, it turns out that uh, when we went to access the money in July of 2019, uh, we were told that although the legislature had appropriated the money, they did not provide authorization for us to draw down the funds. In other words, we had money in our bank account that the legislature had appropriated to us but had not included authorizing um, language in the statute. So about $1.7 million of our technology and development money was trapped in an, in an inaccessible account um, up in Santa Fe. We had to go and uh, secure a, um, a special loan from the Board of Finance. We had to increase our vacancy rate and increase our vacancy savings because once we had built CSU, we couldn't turn the lights off and stop our development. So what instead what we did is we slowed down hiring prosecutors, paralegals, and other personnel. And then we finally got this uh, $2 million um, freed up again just a couple months ago. Uh, and so one of the things that we have done and one of the areas we're gonna continue to explore with the chamber and with business leaders in the community is how to make these projects uh, you know, viable and financially less dependent on the, the peculiar, uh, let's say, uh, processes and procedures that are inherent in the, in the budgeting cycle up in the roundhouse up in Santa Fe. I think that's particularly important in light of the expected hit to the budget that we're going to see um, now coming through COVID. Um, the, the state government's just going to have less money to spend. Um, so we need to come up with a separate uh, foundation, a separate way of dealing with and addressing um, these technological advancements so that we're not left in a position where we've started to move down the road and then we have to stop um, our development plans. Um, that brings me to legislation and policy. Um, you will see um, in the coming, um, I guess, largely virtual 60-day session, a number of things that we think should be priorities and we would certainly invite the chamber's participation and your members' participation in each of these areas. Um, 
the first and frankly my my biggest priority for the upcoming session is the protection um, that I think is lacking for victims of crime um, and specifically protection not from the harm that they've already endured by criminal defendants but by the harm that's inflicted upon them by the criminal justice system here in New Mexico um, and so the best way I think to understand one of the things that we're trying to address is to is to hear from some of those victims themselves uh, and some may recall we actually advanced this as a possible piece of legislation last year, last October, but heading into a, a short session, which is confined to the budget, it simply just didn't, didn't get a hearing, didn't get taken up. We're really gonna make a strong push on this. And it's focused primarily on what victims have to go through in our criminal justice system, that frankly, they don't have to go through in almost any other. So let me play this video and it'll give you a sense of what I'm talking about. The Bernalillo, the Bernalillo County, County District, District, Attorney, District says, Attorney says New Mexico is one of the only states where sexually abused children have to endure more pain because of how they're questioned during investigations. News 13's Rebecca Atkins is live in the Newsplex with the DA's plea to change the law. Rebecca. Well, Jessica, several victims came forward today showing their faces and telling their stories in hopes that people in charge of making the laws in our state will hear them. I watched everything about the experience tear her down mentally, physically. Today, a mother spoke for her daughter, kidnapped by an accused sexual predator in 2017 at just 12 years old. A four-year-old doesn't do anything to deserve a, a, a brutal death. The family of Rebecca Sanchez, murdered by her father and stepmother, stood by in support, along with this young woman who braved a crowd of strangers to tell her story. I was sexually molested when I was 11. It's been seven years now. I'm 19 years old. Ashley Vargas is one of many victims who stood by Bernalillo County District Attorney Raul Torres today, asking New Mexico to change the way children of sexual abuse and violent crimes are questioned during investigations. Just inflicting so many painful questions over and over. You basically just don't want to talk no more. DA Torres played actual recordings, questions asked of children during interviews. Do you know what happens to um, a man when he gets sexually aroused? Vargas says one of those questions vividly stands out in her memory. They were asking me what I wore and I told them I was wearing like tights and like a t-shirt and they asked me why I was wearing tights to bed. They were asking 11 year olds why. They made it seem like it was my fault. Torres has drafted legislation to put a stop to this line of questioning. There is um, a means of securing justice for people, for providing due process for people without doing harm. The bill would prevent defense attorneys and investigators from interrogating children and developmentally delayed adults before trial. I absolutely urge the leaders in Santa Fe to listen to victims, to hear them, and understand that we are failing them. The DA Torres says the drafted bill has been submitted to the governor and he is speaking with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to find a sponsor. Jess. All right, thank you, Rebecca. The New Mexico Public Defender's Office responded to the proposal, calling it a misguided effort to protect people and would actually cause more trauma to victims. To read their full statement, we've posted it on krqe.com. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I can tell you is that, um, not just as a prosecutor, but as a father, it is, um, unconscionable to me that the criminal justice system in this state would permit, um, the infliction of this kind of trauma and this kind of harm on victims, especially minors and um, those with developmental disabilities to have to endure this kind of treatment just to seek justice. Uh, as a federal prosecutor, I can tell you unequivocally that this is not normal. It is not constitutionally uh, required, nor is it a feature, frankly, of the vast majority of states um, in this country. If, if there was a similar situation 
where a child in Indian country was the victim of sexual assault, they would never be required to sit in a pretrial witness interview, which is usually the second or third time they have to recount the details of this kind of trauma um, to, uh, in order just to prepare to go to trial. Um, a child in Indian country simply has an unequivocal right to uh, be confronted um, by defense counsel in open court. And when that happens, as you can imagine, in the presence of a jury and in the presence of a judge, those investigators and defense attorneys uh, usually keep their um, conduct um, to uh, within a more reasonable bound um, or frame of what is acceptable. Um, but these, these highly traumatic pretrial witness interviews are usually the turning point for a number of victims, uh, not only children, but adult victims of sexual assault. And they leave the room and they say, we don't want any part of this. Um, and so we have a huge drop off rate in pursuing some of these crimes precisely because it's a way for um, the defense attorneys to take advantage of the system and scare and intimidate victims um, from having to go through this. That has to change. So the, the package of legislation that we're proposing includes the admissibility of what's called a safe house interview. It's a standard practice in lots of different uh, jurisdictions around the country. Um, a protection, as I mentioned before, a prohibition, a flat prohibition of pretrial witness interviews uh, for children or adults with developmental disabilities um, and strict limitations on how that could be done um, in rare circumstances with adults. Um, we also have a problem in New Mexico where we routinely and under the current rules are required to disclose personal identifying information of victims. So if, if you or one of your loved ones of us a victim of crime and your uh, date of birth, phone number, um, address and other information was included in a police report, if we try to redact that information, we are currently sanctioned by the court. Um, and we've had instances where that information will not only be delivered to defense counsel, but will be delivered to a criminal defendant himself while they're in custody, while they're in jail. Um, it is not, again, something that is standard practice in other parts of the country. Um, and the last piece is to allow victims and others, specifically children, uh, to participate in the judicial process by remote video. Uh, that would also reduce the amount of harm and trauma that's uh, incurred by, by these um, brave um, but very fragile young people as they go through the process. Um, in addition to our victim legislation, we also uh, think it's important to look at some of the broader um, statutes that we have in place to protect the community against, number one, threats of mass violence. Right now, um, a threat of mass violence, uh, putting out on Facebook or in a video that you're going to show up uh, at the mall or you're going to show up in another location and shoot um, uh, people and kill people is a petty misdemeanor under New Mexico law. Um, we think that should be at least a fourth degree felony. We've made that push in the past. We're going to do so again. Uh, we also engaged pretty heavily in election protection this last go around. Um, and one of the things that was pretty striking and something that we actually didn't talk a whole lot about during the election itself was New Mexico happens to be one of the few states in the country where there is no prohibition about taking a firearm to a, to a polling site. I think regardless of your politics, your ideology, I think we can all agree that uh, you know, with heightened political and ideological differences in the country, maybe the last thing we need is to have guns uh, mixed in with that kind of uh, volatile situation. There are a number of states in the country, uh, liberal states like California, conservative states like, like Georgia and Texas and others that prohibit firearms at polling locations. We think that that is a common sense approach and that's something that we will also be focusing our efforts on. The last thing, and this is has more to do with policy um, and potentially with, with um, legislation, but uh, is, is this new policy, and, and it's received coverage in the last couple of weeks, on what we're calling our expanded um, and, and frankly much uh, 
a more comprehensive Giglio policy. Uh, Giglio refers to a Supreme Court case that uh, is a companion case to Brady versus Maryland, where the Supreme Court said prosecutors have specific affirmative obligations to disclose not only exculpatory information to defendants and defense counsel, but also information about law enforcement witnesses that have credibility issues. Specifically, um, if there is an incident uh, in an officer's past that involves an act of dishonesty, falsifying a police report, falsifying uh, a time card, uh, destroying evidence, altering evidence. Um, if they are the subject themselves of criminal charges or convictions, do they have some history, sustained history of racial um, or ethnic uh, bias in their past or case-specific bias? Uh, traditionally, what we did is we relied on defense attorneys to ask in only specific cases and only for specific officers that they had concerns about for us to go and obtain that information, and then we had an obligation to disclose that. I've made the judgment in consultation with prosecutors around the country that we need to standardize this process and not wait for defense attorneys to ask us for this information in case-specific um, instances, but actually to ask it in every single case and, in, and for every single officer. We, I think that this is one of the key ways for prosecutors to try and rebuild and restore public confidence in our criminal justice system in light of um, the unrest that we've seen and some of the, frankly, the lack of confidence that, that uh, exists um, in the criminal justice system. I think it just makes uh, basic sense for us to ask our law enforcement partners if there's anything that is in those categories that we should be aware of. Um, so what it is really gonna boil down to is this systematized uh, inquiry in every case, including an automated questionnaire for our uh, law enforcement partners, uh, asking them specifically, are there findings of misconduct, dishonesty, or racial discrimination? We are then gonna make and file public notices every time um, that information is received and we conduct an independent investigation if we determine that that constitutes what is it, what is known as a Giglio disclosure. Um, we're going to file that notice in open court and then what will make this office, I think, the first in the nation in this regard, we will then take those notices um, and make them available uh, on a public database on our website so that you as members of the public, but more importantly, um, uh, members of other communities can see um, which officers in a community have these sustained findings. And why that's so important is we have um, small departments and police agencies all over the country where a very small number of problematic officers um, have these um, troubling uh, instances in their history. And what they do is they move from agency to agency to agency. And, and, the, and the new community, the new agency has no clear sense that the officer that's being hired actually has this um, in their past. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce um, today publicly that, that we've worked with the Albuquerque Police Department and the Albuquerque Police Officers Association and reached an agreement with them that they are going to cooperate fully. Um, with the implementation of this new policy. And I think um, APD and, and its union deserves great credit for recognizing the importance of that. Uh, unfortunately, um, the sheriff uh, has informed my office uh, that he will not cooperate with this new policy and has in fact ordered his deputies not to answer these questions. Um, so that is an issue that I think will be taken up and you will see um, both some actions that we will take um, in, in court, but also some potential legislative responses that may be required to address this. Um, but I think this is gonna be an important part of police accountability and restoring confidence in the criminal justice system moving forward. And last but not least, I always like to leave um, my presentations um, with you um, and with anyone who is interested in criminal justice issues with a clear understanding and a clear sense of the, uh, of the need for upstream interventions and investments. Um, I've shown this and shared this with you in the past. Unfortunately, this data remains 
uh, largely the same. 28% of the children in New Mexico have experienced four or more ACEs. ACEs, as you'll recall, are um, adverse childhood experiences. Those are instances of child abuse, sexual violence, living in the home of uh, an individual, an adult who has a substance abuse disorder, a psychological disorder. Um, that 28% is incredibly high. Um, what is astounding is the the 86% of incarcerated juveniles in New Mexico who have received who have reported four or more ACEs. So what does that really look like? This is a profile of the young people that are um, reporting specific adverse conditions in their life before they are incarcerated. Um, 13%, nearly 14% uh, report a, uh, attempted suicide nearly 50% struggling with depression, 96% uh, struggling with a substance abuse disorder, and 995 a major psychiatric diagnosis, schizophrenia, depression, et cetera. Um, as I've said to the chamber and others time and again, uh, criminals don't arise um, out of nowhere. They are, they are raised and most often neglected um, throughout their early childhood and their formative years, they see and experience and endure things that are unimaginable. And so by the time they are 14, 15, and 16, um, falling into patterns of conduct and behavior that um, are going to pretty quickly put them on a path to drug addiction. And, uh, and if, if no treatment is, is um, afforded or given to them, violence and uh, recurring um, contact with law enforcement. This is the heart of our problem. This is the heart of our public safety issue. What we are living through now was uh, baked in 15 or 20 years ago with an entire generation of these traumatized children who were not recognized, dealt with, or helped in any significant way. And all you have to see to understand that is this stat at the bottom that says, um, there were nearly 10 CYFD referrals for every one of the children that we ultimately end up incarcerating. That means CYFD was called on average 10 times before they ended up being arrested themselves for engaging in criminal conduct. If we're going to beat this problem um, in the long term and save the next generation and build a brighter community, we have to look at things like the Adobe Project, um, Dr. Xi, um, is one of the true leaders in this community. And the Adobe Project is seeing real positive outcomes. He basically takes a two generation and sometimes three generation approach. Um, substance abuse disorders and children who are released from custody, he goes to their homes. He enrolls them in, in um, healthcare services if their parents are suffering from addiction. He enrolls them in um, substance abuse interventions. He provides psychological treatment and therapy. He provides um, uh, an education navigator to help them get back on track in school. And most importantly for the community, the recidivism rate uh, for the kids that go through Adobe is I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15%. The recidivism rate for those kids who do not and simply go through the standard system without comprehensive treatment um, and therapy and an intervention is something on the order of 70 to 80%. So this not only save li saves lives, but it makes you safer. It saves us money. Um, and it, it, it really is um, the kind of smart and innovative policymaking that we need to engage in. And so that um, concludes my, my presentation. I know that this probably, uh, hopefully has engendered at least a few questions and I'm happy to take those now if I can. Well, first I wanna give you a sincere thank you, uh, DA Torres and crime is obviously one of the most critical issues our community is facing. And that was a, an interesting and very important presentation. And just wanna say, please know that your work and effort is appreciated. And uh, I know we had talked about some questions. Uh, Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul and DA Torres. Thank you so much for just another great presentation. We, we always look forward to, to your presentation every year. And I know it's a real passion of yours, uh, particularly uh, with regard
regard to families and children. And I know you work with, uh, in fact, you head up the Mission Families uh, effort there with the United Way and have done that for several years, trying to address how we stabilize families in, in New Mexico and break that, that cycle. So thank you for your work there. Um, a question here uh, for you, DA, from uh, Chris McKee at KRQE News 13. Um, going back to uh, the decrease in felony litigation initiated in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, is the decrease uh, because uh, just less crime happening in the county, or is there another reason like work from home efforts and changes in court availability or grand jury efforts make it harder to file the litigation? No, I, it's a great it's a great question from Chris. Um, the, the The short answer is it has to do with the complete elimination of the grand jury. And again, and I want to make this clear, I support can, the uh, cancellation of the grand jury during the COVID pandemic. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, what but what it does is it paints a pretty stark picture for what a community and what a justice system looks like when you eliminate the grand jury, because every felony case now must be initiated, must be initiated by a preliminary hearing. Those preliminary hearings are full evidentiary hearings. What that means is that no essential witness can be unavailable. Uh, a victim can't be unavailable, an eyewitness can't be unavailable, a police officer can't be unavailable, and shockingly, um, if a defendant makes himself unavailable, which you can imagine they have a little bit of an incentive to make themselves unavailable, I can't start my case. Um, and that, that is purely a function of the rules for preliminary hearings. We have submitted proposed uh, changes to the preliminary hearing, which would bring them into alignment, for example, with federal practice. The Supreme Court has not responded in any way. Um, has not taken up that rule change, as far as I know, hasn't even referred the rule change to the rule committee. Um, and that's, you know, within the power and discretion of the Supreme Court. What I will say is that if we don't have a rule change in, pre in prelims, um, when we're on the other side of the pandemic and receiving vac vaccinations and hopefully getting the world back to some sense of normal, we have to restore the grand jury. Uh, there's simply no, there aren't enough police officers, there aren't enough prosecutors, and guess what? There aren't enough judges to actually feed this, you know, this volume of cases into that system and actually get back to the number of felony cases that we need to start. So it's going to be something that either is resolved by a rule change or the restoration of the grand jury once the pandemic is done. And I assume that, uh, fear of COVID is a legitimate reason for a witness to miss a hearing. I assume you hear that all the time. Well, what, what we've seen, now we're doing remote hearings. So we have done, we don't even do in-person pre okay. preliminary hearings. Um, so we've actually had, I think, greater, what's interesting is, is COVID has uh, provided an opportunity for us to kind of explore how different things might work. Um, under different circumstances, we have, a, I think, a lower rate of police officers and victims who are unable to attend because they don't have to physically come to court. Uh, the problem is, you know, we, if we have defendants not showing up, it, it, doesn't real, it doesn't really matter that, you know, if we can't proceed with a preliminary hearing because the defendant has not bothered to show up, hasn't been detained, uh, then we're just stuck. And what that really means is, the evidence goes stale, eyewitnesses move away, police officers change agencies. And so we wait until that defendant gets picked up on a bench warrant, because that's what happens. They fail to show up for a preliminary hearing, even a remote preliminary hearing. A bench warrant is issued. There is no comprehensive system to go and sweep up defendants who fail to show up for court. Our police agencies are too small. Uh, we don't have the manpower, so what usually happens is we wait for this person to get pulled over in a traffic stop, and that respond that officer in that reactive moment says, "Oh, you have a you have a warrant out for your arrest." Then we put him back into custody. Then we try to launch the case again. But until that happens, we're, we're kind of stuck. Okay. <laughs> Thus, fewer initiations this year. Yeah. yeah. Terry Cole, I think you have a question. I do. Thank you, Kyle. So, uh, DA Torres, you know, as we all do our jobs day in, day out, there are things that just keep us up at night. 
What's yours? Uh, you know, I, I, I would say that it used to be the, the rules on detention, uh, but I don't have a much control over that. But, but what, really, what really keeps me up at night is the, what you heard from that young woman um, and what she endured in a pretrial witness interview. Um, it's not right. It's not right to do that to children, and it's not right to do that to victims. Um, and so when I have, when I go home at night, I'm trying to just sort of let go of the day and I'm hanging out with my kids. I can't help but think about what it would do to me and what it would mean to me to have, uh, one of my children or, uh, somebody that I love in my family or a friend to have to go through that. Um, and to know that it isn't part of the justice, it isn't something that is a natural or normal part of the justice system anywhere in the country. Um, and we have the power to fix it. Uh, the question is, do we have the political will to fix it? Uh, so that's what keeps me up at night. And it's also why uh, uh, this is the kind of this is the kind of job that uh, wears you out. And I'm reminded of that when I look at the pictures that I think the chamber put up of my first couple years in office and I had uh, a lot less gray in my beard and a lot less gray <laughs> on top. But uh, it's also what it's also what motivates me to do the job. Well, you look distinguished. <laughs> well, let me let me follow up with that regarding uh, detention. I mean, wh why, why is it that our state judiciary and our legislature are, are more conservative regarding detention than other states. I mean, it seems like a, an obvious fix for us. I mean, we continue to lead the country or lead near the top of the country with our crime rates. And that, to me, seems and feels like a, a fairly obvious fix. Yeah, I mean, we, we, the, there was a long process. There was a committee that was formed on it. Um, there, was, there was data that was, sh that was shown uh, from an independent report. I think a, a lot of that data was, frankly, flawed. Uh, data in part because, you know, we were looking at, well, there wasn't a high recidivism rate of the individuals who, who were released. And, and what that does is what, what they're actually looking at is, were they arrested for something? Um, not whether they committed a new crime, but whether they were arrested for something. And I think if you understand the really low clearance rates for aggravated assault and aggravated burglary, you start to understand that we're, we're actually not catching most of these folks, but what is surprising to me is states like California, which you know they're traditionally viewed as pretty liberal or progressive states. Even California has presumptions for when you use a firearm, we're going to keep you in jail, or if you've already committed a new fel uh, another felony and you commit another one, we're going to keep you in jail. Um, and we're not going to, you know, New Mexico in the judiciary has made a decision not uh, to do that. I, I continue to be surprised by the fact that um, the legislature doesn't want to take it up, um, but, but it, that is what it is. And so I'm, again, my focus is on victim legislation and on protecting those kids and protecting those adults, mostly sexual assault survivors from having to relive their trauma. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of things that we need to fix in the system. And I think that's a pretty, you know, it's, it's hard to watch that young woman's uh, account and not think about your own friends and family and wonder why we are doing that to New Mexico's children. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another question uh, from Nancy Laughlin at KOAT. Uh, can you talk more about the number of homicides this year? Yeah, so uh, you know, and I'm I'm going off of the uh, the recent reports that that I saw. Um, I know it's it's a constant, unfortunately, a, an ever changing number as each day goes by, but we are more or less on track with last year. I think we are just below the pace that was set last year. I think there was a hope, frankly, that when one of the silver linings in the COVID pandemic would be that we would see this reduction in violent crime. Um, not only, uh, you know, here, but across the country. And that just hasn't been borne out um, by the data. Um, and, you know, there, there, there really is 
only one way to get through this, and that is to get law enforcement um, and put police and prosecutors and the courts focused like a laser on those small uh, groups of individuals who are overwhelmingly responsible for prevented, you know, violent crime. Um, and there are a number of straightforward things that we can do to address that situation from resource investments to new technologies, new strategies, and new rules, but you, you need collective action and you don't have that kind of collective action just yet from the, from the stakeholders and leaders in the community. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Question from uh, Bruce Stidworthy, uh, kind of following up on the bill that you're, you're going to propose to protect childhood victims. Uh, does that bill have a sponsor yet? And what is the rationale for, for those who might oppose this legislation? Uh, well, I, I will take the second part first, and that is simply to say I, I, I haven't, uh, I can't tell you what the rationale would be uh, for most folks to see it. I can tell you that the criminal defense attorneys in this state uh, conflate this process and say, well, this is, you will often hear people say, well, we have a right to confront uh, witnesses. And that is absolutely true. But in every other, or not every other state, I think 47 out of 50 states, that right to confront a witness occurs at trial. It doesn't occur um, outside of the presence of a jury or a judge. Um, and so, and you got to remember too, that by the time they're doing these witness interviews, one of these children is usually disclosed to a friend, a parent, a teacher, and a law enforcement officer. So those statements that have been given to those other individuals, those are already been given over to defense attorneys. So they have ample information for which to prepare for cross-examination. Um, so we'll see. I, I am working with a number of members of the legislature to see who is the best and most appropriate sponsor in both the House and the Senate, um, but that's still sort of a work in progress. I think we'll have more to say about that probably next week. Okay. Okay. Uh, regarding property crime, uh, I mean, it is trending in the right direction. It's trended down fairly steadily since 2017, which is, uh, which is good news. Um, right. what, what do you attribute that to? Well, I think property crime is, uh, it's frankly, it's a much, it's, it's, it's a much easier nut to crack in terms of your strategic approach. Uh, so take, take, for example, motor vehicle theft. You can flood a part of the community or, or coordinate different sort of traffic rotations and just run license plates and check for stolen cars and do those sorts of things. It's a very, um, it, you know, it it's relies on, on manpower. Um, and then once you've identified a greater number of these individuals, we we worked with our law enforcement partners to start to strengthen the cases once they come over and then sort of to ratchet up those repeat offenders. Violent crime is a much more difficult thing because that you're not, you're not fishing for, you know, a big group uh, of individuals who are pretty easy to identify. This is more of a needle in a haystack we know where the needles are. We know where the haystack is. We just have to get people oriented and focused in the right direction. And that's what we're doing now increasingly uh, with folks. But uh, it's going to take a lot more concentrated effort and, frankly, more investigative and specialized units in our police departments to tackle that head on. Okay. Well, DA Torres, thank you. There, there are several more questions, but uh, I'm going to... Uh... To cut that off just because we've got some time constraints but uh, really really appreciate your time this morning um, you've been a great partner with the chamber in the past uh, during the legislative session count on us again uh, we'll be taking up uh, our positions in the coming days prior to the uh, to the session but uh, uh, the grand jury uh, increased grand juries after we get through covid uh, the victim protections uh, funding for for your CSU unit, uh, the pretrial detention issues that you mentioned, um, count on us and, and our support uh, for all of those things. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, 
Let me uh, also just thank the audience. Appreciate uh, everyone that was on on the call this morning, uh, all of our business leaders, investors, partners for joining us uh, again today. Uh, and again, we appreciate our sponsors. Uh, you see them on the screen, PNM, New Mexico Mutual, Bank of Albuquerque, US Bank, UNM, Comcast, Albertsons, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Giltmore, Janes, Molina, Presbyterian, Western Sky, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Unirac, General Mills, KPMG, New Mexico Bank and Trust, KOB, and U.S. Eagle. Thank you all. We hope uh, everyone will uh, make an effort to attend the second event in our Business Beat uh, Speaker Series, which is coming up on December 15th uh, from 2 to 3. It will feature David Abbey uh, for an up-to-the-minute look at our state's finances and the fiscal outlook uh, for the upcoming fiscal year and the pace of our economic recovery. Uh, that will be the last event uh, that we'll put on in 2020, and we hope that you'll all register and attend. So we're thankful uh, to have had you with us today. Uh, please stay safe, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.